Okay, I think we're all ready to share and to get started. At, you know, as, as most of us, we've been kind of thrust into this world of uh, working remotely. I've always been a remote worker, so it's, it's nothing new for me. But what's new is trying to reach out and communicate to people that usually I'm live, <laughs> I'm live in front of. So um, I, I've taken some of the presentations I've given live. And I'm moving them online uh, as a way to not only encourage people to explore the format and explore how to present remotely, but I also wanted to share some information, some things that I won't get to share at some of the live tech meetings that I was scheduled to present. So let's just go through some of these things. This is going to be something I put out for, for just everybody. So. I wanted to um, make an introduction. In case you don't know who I am, I run a, a, a blog called Data and Donuts. It's been, gosh, about five or six years, and I just started originally just as a place to put stuff. You know, when I read something or something neat, it was always so hard to find out where these, uh, where the resources were. Where did I put that? Did I print it out? Is it online? And I thought I just started cataloging, and then I started sharing it, and then it started to get shared, and and here we are. So you know, I write I write basic articles about things, uh, timely things, things of interest, things that I think might help other people who might be uh, challenged with some of the same things. Um, I collaborate. Uh, most of the time, I am usually live, uh, working in workshops, presenting, um, teaching classes. But, you know, I'm starting to experiment with, well, what's that going to look like? You know, what is the post-COVID-19 world going to look like? Are we going to gather in super large crowds and go into breakout rooms? I mean, is this really going to make people um, a little more wary of that type. So over the next few weeks, I am starting to record different segments. Uh, I'm running a teachable class, which I'll share the link when we're up, up and ready, where we'll be teaching some of the skills. But I wanted to do kind of like an overview of some of the work that I've done and share it out in the, in the space. So basically, just to take a look, um, I, these are the tools that I tend to work with the most, Qualtrics, the survey tool, Tableau, R, Python. I bring a lot of different things to different sorts of problems, and you may get a little insight to that as we move through um, what I'm going to share with you today. And the different ways I engage, that, there I am, <laughs> having a better hair today, I guess. But uh, sometimes it's just me and a client, sometimes it's me and a group of people, sometimes you know, we j there's nothing really off the shelf. It really just depends on the needs. And, you know, we usually have an appointment and we figure out um, how it's going to work. And less of the location stuff. All the location stuff is really canceled. So I've started to fill up some of the remote online stuff uh, for some archive training. And, you know, it's pretty user-friendly because we're all just starting to figure this all out, right? So um, I'm going to remove this and use the screen to kind of just show you um, what we're looking at here. This is, you know, the UN has these sustainable goals on this knowledge platform. And I apologize if this doesn't fit in your whole screen. This is, I had everything set for the big screen and I didn't really hop back in and change all the settings, but I can make it work. So basically we're looking at all these, these very uh, lofty goals here, you know, no poverty, zero hunger, you know, what do we, what's the infrastructure going to look like, agriculture, climate, all of these things. And we try to think, well, gosh, you know, how are we going to get data to even begin sorts, those sorts of conversations? And the answer to some of that is, you know, census data. And, you know, usually when you say census data, in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, everyone's going to be so excited. Census data, woohoo, you know. But a lot of times what happens is people get very intimidated by census data. They don't really know um, what it is. They don't know how it's going to impact, you know, their ability to say, um, you know, communicate. So a lot of times they're not as excited as I'd like them to be. 
So I feel like if I could just maybe alleviate some of those fears through um, giving you a little information of how to work with the data. So basically, you know, I've used to only solely healthcare. I spoke to healthcare executives, I spoke to health journalists, uh, medical doctors, all kinds of healthcare providers. And then I noticed that there was something common, like that was upstream from whatever the particular project was. And it was really understanding demographic data and how we can use it to give, shed a light on community attributes at the, you know, more granular level. So this is, was a cover of an um, economist. And I just thought it was kind of funny because you could be anything here. You could be healthcare, you could be a businessman, you know, we're just, we're looking at the demographics. And what's interesting about demographic information that I find is that, you know, it, it's the science, you know, I mean, I'm a, bi a bench biologist by training first, you know, doing a thesis in population genetics. Um, before that, I had a doctorate in chiropractic. Since then, I've gone on to uh, get more expertise in data and the Columbia School of Engineering had an executive online program um, in applied analytics and I hopped on board and you know learned a lot you know a lot of, in python and it just it kind of just adds another layer to how you think because the way i've always thought when i read new information or i'm looking in a book or even just speaking on a panel it's not these moments where it's like got it this is it this is the answer you know i rarely present an answer it's always more like well, what's that thing and what does that mean and that that's kind of irregular and why is that outlier there so i try to teach people like how to be curious and you know the there's a modern and you know a historical part you know socrates the, Soc the socratic method is basically when someone questions you right it gives you more questions so you know you look at it, some information like wow you know is that is that true is that really true how do you know that's true and how does that make you feel if this information was presented to you as a truth are you uncomfortable with it can you accept it on its merits what happens if it is true does it define or unravel some part of you that makes you uncomfortable and that's where byron katie comes in um, if you haven't heard of her what i like about her is she talks about holding tensions like holding two things together that might conflict. It reminds me a little bit of cognitive dissonance, but it's like an awareness of when you have a discussion and you bring data to the table to start the discussion or to, you know, maybe enhance your way of looking at the, um, what sorts of data you're gonna source. You know, it's very, very important to be able to fully define the question in spite of perhaps bringing data into the table that might, might unravel your theory. And you know, what I like about, I use a lot of graphics and images to kind of bring this point home more or less, because I feel like it's very important to find out how people view graphics and, you know, graphicacy. So, you know, looking at the Tate Modern, looking at this painting, you know, there's lots of things that people say about it. Quite often they notice there's a splash in the water. Sometimes they notice that there's two splashes in the water. So there's probably, there could be two people, or perhaps that's just, just like a peripheral wave into the pool. But there's a lot of things to observe. The angle of the springboard coming out. You know, in my mind, it looks like to me that they jumped in from the other side. But, you know, we could talk about that. What makes me think that, you know, look at the positioning of these trees behind the building and what's reflected to you, you know, in here. And there's a single chair. There's just lots of different information that we can bring in. And you can also look and maybe think, wow, whoever designed this piece of art, this graphic, they really want me to look here. And that, you know, goes back to pre-attentive attributes, right? We all talked about that. We can use things like size and position and tone and color and all of those things to guide the eye. And the important part is maybe we need to be aware of when that's happening so we can kind of be able to look in a more neutral and unbiased way. Now, what I like about this right here, the portrait you just saw, is a David Hockney portrait. 
and I saw this on Twitter and I thought it was really, really interesting. So this, this picture also by Dave Hockney is showing Ed Sheeran. You know, I, I don't, I mean, I know who he is and I thought this was quite a uh, positive sketch. I liked it. I liked the way they tried to capture the tattoos and everything. But what happened was somebody who may not be familiar with David Hockney writes this critique of this, well, the part you have to see. Okay, you have to see the whole picture to be able to appreciate the critique. So, so what happens is somebody sees this and they automatically are like, I don't like that. If your mother had done that in our class, you'd be like, well done, mommy, you know, like, because the fingers weren't, you know, to this guy's liking. And then Jerry Saltz, who has taught me a lot about looking at graphics in the way that he, a famous, you know, uh, art critic, looks at art, art, you know, he looks at the context of the art. He looks at how it's displayed, you know, what light is coming in from the windows, you know, is it in a very large room and it's very small scale, all of the information that, that kind of adds to the experience has to do with music and lighting and everything that's around the art and what's in the room with the art. And I feel like those skills apply directly to how we look at visualizations. So what he basically says is, you know, think about it. This man is now 82 years old. He's retained his optical acumen, his nuance, his control, his love of line, his love of looking. And you can tell it's a love of looking, how playful he is with the tattoos and how he sketches Ed Sheeran and how this is just something from the present. And I thought that was really a really interesting observation and a way to critique a work. Because if you don't know David Hockney, uh, what's very important is, you know, he's, he's an older man, he's in his 80s, um, he's, his painting portrait of, of an artist, part of the series, by the way, that I, I represented here, uh, had the highest revenue from anything brought at Christie's. So when someone comes in and critiques a piece of his art without looking at the whole picture, um, you can see how they may be biased in their presentation. So what I like to show here is statistics, you know, they're like swimwear, what they reveal is suggestive, but what they, you know, what they hide is vital. And, that, and that's absolutely true, right? We have to transparency in how we present data and how we present information. And, you know, I'm putting that there because I'm leading into the part where we start looking at, you know, we think that when we're looking at data, we're, we're really telling a whole story, but here's where the problem lies we're only looking at the data that we can find. So there's data that's out there, we bring it in, it's freely available, we can have our discussions, and done and done. And then as a journalist, there's also FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. If there's data out there that they don't necessarily want you to be able to access, but you have a legal right and they have to provide it to you. That's where we got all of the information around opioids that kind of undid a lot of the Sackler you know, obfuscation, we were able to get that information and review those records. So, but then again, think about it. What's the most powerful type of data that there is? How about the data they just don't even bother collecting? They're not collecting it because they don't, they definitely don't want you to, to have it. And there's lots of things about accurate birth registration, especially in minorities, um, you know, certain types of contaminants in water, um, you know, lots of crimes, this publicly available gun trace data that she's, her hands are holding here. So you have to think about data that you might want that's actually not even being collected and how problematic that might be and how that can add even more bias into the conversation. So the, you know, the whole point of me wanting to gather around is a lot of the work I do, again, is in census data. And a lot of that was necessity. You know, I needed huge amounts of data to be able to look at communities, to be able to look at uh, data that might be linked to some health surveys and things like that. So I got really interested in looking at race and ethnicity, uh, not only as, as a brown woman walking in this world, but I would get a lot of data collected on my behalf and, and then it would be my job to analyze it. And I would see all this race data collected in cohorts. And I'd say, well, what do you want me to do with it? I, I don't, it's, it's not a biologic, it's a very poor biologic proxy. It doesn't mean anything if it's just 
a checked box. And if we're talking about a social or political construct that this racial categorization is supposed to be reporting, we need to name what that specific thing is. And I usually start off by just telling people like the history of race and how it's changed. Um, gosh, since the first census, you know, it used to be the enumerator, the person collecting the data would take a look at the person that they were trying to gather data about and they'd make a determination whether somebody was white, black, yellow, you know, they just looked at them. Sometimes if they weren't sure, they kind of looked at their role in the community. They made all of these very biased, subjective determinations to put people into classifications. And when we look back now, you know, with our modern eye and analytics, we realize what was that all about? And we'll dabble a little more into that. But, um, you know, the reason the census also came to my mind this year, obviously, is because it's a diennial year. We're going to be doing the census again. And I use the American Community Survey every day, you know, every year. It comes out every year, and it's basically the long form of the census that used to come out according to a schedule. Now it's every year. And some of the diennial people will get a long form, but most of the, this one is the, is the old long form. And when you try to think about, well, what kind of measures can I get? Well, look, there's ancestry, citizenship, you know, language, employment status. You can look at food stamps, health insurance. You can look at housing. You can look at jobs, you know, to understand the economy. There's a lot of great information that is actually brought from this into some of the other um, economic discussions we have in our country. So, you know, I wanted to share this. It's, it's a bit cut off. I'm trying to move that over, but I can't. But anyway, so what you see here is, slide that a little bit. So, you know, when we're looking at race, so the um, Office of Management and Budget decides what we're gonna be classifying this year. They famously decided not to collect Middle Eastern. And then some of the categories they do, they roll them up into other categories. Like if you're Egyptian, well, sorry, you're white. I personally don't know any Egyptians that identify as white, but we have these huge buckets that have been created. We have Hispanic origin. We have foreign born. We have ancestry. So there's a lot of different layers that we can look at when we're trying to put people into, into buckets. And it's important to know, like, what, what do those buckets mean, right? You can get very specific at the nation level, region, state, county, census tracts, census blocks. A lot of those lower levels switch around based on population estimates, which is why it's important for everybody to be counted. They don't really go below a block because you, they don't want the data to be able to trace back to a single person. You know, your identity is supposed to be protected. So, you know, this is just a review of like, well, what's actually in this data? What, what, what do we see? Sample estimates, we get official counts, population totals, population characteristics are what's in that American Community Survey. And if you're anything like me and you use this data, I use it for control group data. I use it to see like if I want to make a control group against a certain population reporting a certain type of disease. I like to use American Community Survey data. You have it for every year and it's very, very important. Uh, a lot of times, you know, uh, when I'm measuring poverty, if I'm trying to look at poverty, you have to think about it. if I'm trying to look at poverty, it's not just about, oh, I didn't have a job or I went hungry last week. You have to look at exposure. And the census is perfect about not only capturing data about work, about housing situation, about access to utilities, to computers, to broadband, transportation. They also do it with exposure because they go back, you know, any time in the last month, in the last six months, in the last year, and you collect all that data and it's a richer source of understanding what sorts of exposure to social or structural elements of health or just structural determinants period can impact or outcomes in a community. So, you know, a lot of times people don't don't realize that this is this is a marketing tool, right? If you want to know who lives where, how their employment are, what, what type of um, what type of 
services are in the community? Um, how, how many residents are there? You know, how, what's the transportation like? Do they drive? You know, these are all important things that maybe we don't realize we can find out in our census data. Now, my purpose today is just to get you excited about census data and then we can specifically, you know, there'll be other workshops and things that you can get to um, that I'll be leading that will show us step by step, you know, how to get that sort of information. Now, this one, I think is very interesting because it looks at classification, right? So you can look and you can see how different racial groups were categorized back here when they when they were slaves, free colored persons, Negro, Negro black. And this, if you scan over this, it tells you, because if you're trying to look comparatively over a period of time and these classifications have changed, you need to know about that. Now, and one of the reasons why I find that to be so incredibly relevant is because of look at the different buckets. You know, you, you could be, if I just want to look at blacks as, as a bucket, we have blacks in the Atlantic Islands, Central America, China, Czechoslovakia. You know, it's not some kind of homogenous bucket. And the same thing for white people. It's not a homogenous bucket. So if we're lumping everyone together, to what purpose? So I use IPUMS uh, because they harmonize data around different things. You can go right to the census data, uh, but through IPUMS, there's other data sets that, that you can link with it. So basically you just get a customized data set. You can go in here and it's for social, economic, and health research. Uh, that pretty much ticks all the buckets. You know, you can get data out of here you can look at the household level you can go for year these are all the different years you can have and it's quite extensive um let me show you i mean like there's just everything under the sun 1880 <laughs> i mean you know i feel like that might go pretty far back for you but you know we can also look at the household level geographic, group quarters, economic, all these different characteristics. Um, person, you know, health status, veteran status, disability. They also do very good uh, mental health, race, ethnicity, health insurance status. And then other variables are in here too. And these are har harmonized variables. And you get your data cart and you export it and it comes back in. You can get as a CSV, Stata, different formats. And then you're ready to go. Well, more or less, but that's a whole other course. <laughs> So um, here's an example if you, if you just pulled it into like uh, a spreadsheet. Yeah, in a spreadsheet, it's sort of a hot mess because when you're looking at census data, you kind of have to say, these are the assumptions I made. These are the populations I included. These are the populations I didn't include. And I find that that's extremely relevant. But sometimes when you have a spreadsheet that you can't update, that there's no transparency, you know, it, it's very problematic because you're going to be doing these things again and again. In fact, I created a data warehouse so I wouldn't have to do this more than once. And um, that could be another uh, topic that we hit, but just like how to take this, make a data warehouse out of it. So when you're bringing in new data, you don't have to remember that this is the state FIP code um this is uh the mortgage you know you can sit there and change some of these codes into data that you can use and you won't have to keep repeating it um, now this is just a picture of the, my tableau prep screen normally you would see a flow of all the decisions i made and then you can go back in and you can peek and you can see it was hard to to do that live in the workshop we do it live because we can share the screen live but um for here if you look, there's things that I did, serial numbers, you're not going to add them. So I create the, I turn them into strings so that I can use these as a level, a key identifier. And so I was able to just realize that this one right value corresponded to everything else. And this is a sample of all these rows that you see here. So these are all things like, you know, where, where they're from. Um, what else do we have in here? Race, but I haven't coded this yet. 
but you can see we're looking at metro regions if we want to look at that level the city level the county level the state level um, you can also go down to the um, census block level and then down here um, health care of any kind is what this means education a detailed education degree field um, employee status it goes on and on and on and um, and that, so you could get an idea of how this is why this is such a rich source of information. A lot of times when I'm looking at data sets, I want to just do a quick look. I want to know like what are we collecting? What are the what are the categories? What do the headings look like? And this is why skills in Python or R are really handy because I can just write a couple lines of code here. Um, and I can take a look and I can see those same regions that we had pulled in from Excel into Tableau Prep. I can see them here. I can see how many fields they are. I can scroll through. Um, oh, here, down here, I want to scroll. Hold on. Hold on. I can look down here and see the variable types, the numeric, categorical. This is the, panda, the pandas profiling I just called right here. This is all the code you need. Because the problem I find with Python and R and different computer languages is people are like, I don't have time to learn a computer language. I don't have the skill. I don't have the science. You don't have to learn the whole language just to know how to write a few lines of code to get your information. And that's what I try to teach people when we work in these workshops. I'm not going to teach, I mean, if you want to know Python, you know, I tend to use Pandas Library or SciPy. Uh, but that's great if you want to know it, but I just to give people tools of how to source data, analyze the data, clean it up and get ready for analysis. You don't have to go in that deep because you saw like this stuff that was running what was just generated by the four lines of code. And then here's how I profile the data. And what this gives me here, which, you know, to me is non trivial is I get to see, you know, I get a snapshot of some of my data, how many values I have. I can find out how much of the data is, has missing data in it. Some of this is categorized wrong because maybe this is, should be a string and it's still a numeric or vice versa. But this still gives you a glance at what the variables, the age variables, what's the average age? Well, 41. I mean, some of this can just give you really good information right off the bat. Most people have three bedrooms. You see what I'm saying? You can see birth year. So it does give you a little bit of a profile of your data and it tells you what may or may not be missing. Look what's missing here, citizenship. Wow, why would people not want to say where they're from? Hmm. So you, you see what I'm hinting at here. Some of the, if the information's missing and some of the information isn't captured in every uh, survey or in every, um, uh, you know, every type of survey. So that's one of those reasons. But I don't want to get too far, you know, down the rabbit hole in this, but it's a really interesting. We can dig a little deeper. Uh, and just, you know, I know we're kind of just jumping in and out because this is kind of like an overview of the different types of information. But if we hear about low unemployment, we're like low unemployment. Is that is it true? What does that mean? What types of unemployment? Um, and you can these reports are all freely available. So I'm just showing here how everyone's showing low unemployment, low unemployment. But what happens if we start digging a little deeper? You know, if we want to just understand what that means, if we add it 225,000 jobs, why are there so many people that are still, you know, falling all over the edge? That they're not working. They, they don't understand why. They hear all these reports of all the work that's out there. So what I wanted to do is take a look at some of these um, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. And all this data can be outport. You can out export it, outport. You can export it into Tableau and you can analyze it. Some of these I did, some of these I just grabbed right off the site because I feel like the point here is to let you know the data lives out there and then you find it, you can find a use for it. But what I thought was interesting is this is the labor force participation rate. So the lower this is, this means the less people are participating. And having said that, we're still up in the 60% of labor, but when you see that it's falling, these are places where interventions may be possible, or is it falling the same for everybody? What if we want to compare it to women? Uh, women look like they're impacted a little more, right? 
Uh, do I want to look by race? Black African American women. Um, how about 16 to 19 year olds? You can kind of see that just because we report a number, it doesn't mean it's it, it's aggregated. If we really want to intervene or understand a little more about what's going on, we have to be able to ask the questions. I mean, look at all the information in here. People not in the labor force. You know, these are all things that you can just look at, you know, they're marginally attached, they're discouraged. You know, this is really interesting measures that you can look at and create your own story. You can add the layer to something to know a little bit more about a, a community, a population. So my argument with you is that these things are a lot more complex. Look at all the data here that we can look at that adds a little more granularity and technicolor and cinema, you know, a cinematic um, approach to something that's usually presented us in a very linear way, I would encourage you to look at some of this data. And then we're looking here, you know, um, this is the employment situation as well. So if you look here, this is the people, the percentage of the that that are employed and it's seasonal. So you can take a look and see what might be changing this. And again, the same measures. You can see, wow, this, you know, this is more of an impact. This is more of an impact. So I just like you to know that these, when when the numbers are released, you know, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that tell you unemployment rate, this is all the data that they're actually capturing that we, we don't take the time to look at. Now this one doesn't populate sometimes, so I, I, I do kind of like a uh, Julia Child and I, I put a lasagna in the oven <laughs> so we can look at it here. So this is really interesting too, because if you wanna look and say, wow, look at the employment change, this is the average one month net change. Look at all these industries that are adding jobs. Um, and we're looking at this, we could see the thicker they are, the more like education, health services, hospitals, you know, you see, but then, you know, if you really want to ask more questions, you want to look down here. Wow, these are all losses. This is a negative net change in mining and business support and nursing residential care. Why would this be? Sporting goods. We don't, we don't know. This is where we could start looking. So when we say the employment numbers are up, that's an aggregation. Some of them are down. If you really want to know if you work in economy, you know, in economics or economic development, you want to get a handle on that. And these are weekly earnings by industry. And what's interesting is the people going like hog wild is the private sector. The private sector is doing much better than the guys over here and the average weekly earnings that are down here that are below. So when you graph and look at things visually, things start to pop up and you're able to see the weekly earnings. You know, what kinds of jobs? Are these jobs where people are making a lot of money, not as much money? Look how where leisure and hospitality is. So th these are things you wanna interact with and understand that if we're looking at, um, we're looking at average weekly earnings and employment levels, you know, there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye, correct? So now we might want to look at what types of jobs. And I, this article is great. If you want it, reach out to me, the bullshit job boom. And I've had these bullshit jobs where they've given me gobs of money to write a report about something that's going to be going to be presented at a conference. And then you go to the conference with this, you know, $18,000 report that you wrote and it falls off the agenda because there wasn't enough time or they didn't get to it. So this is really interesting to think about the kinds of jobs that are also at the higher scale in the gig economy as well. Now, when you look at metro areas, metro areas looking at the year percent total change in their employment, percent change, this would be up, here's the median. So if you fall below the median, and, and below the average, you know, below the median on both, on both axes, you know, you can see the places that are really, really super struggling. And you can just scroll over here and find exactly what area they are and what the percent change was. And this is important information. You know, we can't just always aggregate things to a high level and say, everything looks good here.
So I always like to ask people, you know, what is it you, that you're actually measuring? And this brings me back to this slide again. Like when you collect buckets and you create cohorts of race, what are you trying to measure? And, you know, this, this one I thought was very, very clear because when we measure, you know, Hispanic populations, and this is looking at healthcare, asthma, cancer, heart disease, and the question was asked, have you been diagnosed in the last maybe three months with any of these things? And it could be the last year. And the thing is, if you look at, these are Hispanic populations, but Hispanic means different things. It's Puerto Ricans, it's multiple Hispanic, it's Mexican, Dominican, Cuban. You know, these are not a homogenous group of people. So when we start looking at data that's this complicated, you know, we could say about high cholesterol, just looking at the data here, and you know, we don't know how complete this is, but it seems like, it appears, Central and South American Hispanics have a lot a higher rate of cholesterol, high cholesterol, you know, but maybe not as much diabetes as, you know, Mexicans. I mean, this is really important information to be able to capture at a granular level if we hope to intervene. And, you know, looking at back, you know, kind of tying it back to GDP, that measure that, seen, that we use for absolutely everything, I thought this was really interesting from Robert Kennedy, you know, so you know how long ago that was. He's writing about the limits of, G of GDP in this article. And I put the article here because then you could go in and explore it and read the whole thing for context. But I took the quote out. Um, that you see here. And what, what they're saying is, you know, GDP, and this is what we use to talk about our strong economy, it's not measuring a lot of the things that make our societies and communities rich. It's not measuring the public integrity of our public officials. It's not measuring, you know, um, the health of our children, the quality of our education, you know, things that bring us joy. So they're really talking about the limits of using GDP as a measure of, hey guys, everything's great, GDP's up. And there's just a few more th things that you can go to for you know, the State of the Union in numbers. This is a really important, if you scroll down here you know, and you wanna know, well, how strong is the economy really? And they do similar graphics. They're looking at wages by sector here, you know, trying to tell you, you know, the monthly unemployment, where, where was this impacted? Manufacturing, real estate. You can look, how's the population changing? How, what's net migration look like? Where's the money going that the government is spending? What's the income distribution? I mean, these are all important things, you know, how you need to get granular to understand. And, um, and if you look at education, you know, the biggest thing that keeps showing up is, you know, lower education is impacted more negatively. Maybe we could do something to encourage, you know, more education. So these are just really good resources to look if you, if you need to have an economic understanding of, of communities. Because, you know, what is GDP anyway, right? It really is, I mean, I might be making this a little, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but, you know, there's three basic groups. It's, you know, uh, personal consumption, gross pr private, um, domestic investment. And, you know, you can see the gross private investment is tanking. These are going up. So what this means is this is kind of like the capital investment that you would make into growing a business or expanding a business or creating more opportunity for your employees. It might, it might go down if instead of selling more product or expanding a product line, you're doing share buybacks or giving dividends back to shareholders. These are all different dynamic processes that make some of these numbers very complicated. And, you know, you can see that right here. Um, let me center this a little bit better for you. When you look here, these are all like, when we think of social determinants of health, you know, it's not just about health, economic stipulation. Well, I mean, this all leads back to it, but you can see all of these different buckets, you know, the healthcare system, community and social context, 
food, agriculture, things like that. You can actually map actual food deserts. You know, there's data out there for that. There's education, there's neighborhood and physical environments, economic stability. You know, uh, go back to neighborhood and physical environments. How many properties are vacant? You know, there's lots of information that can go back and, and give us a little more texture. Most of us by now have heard of blue zones. These are areas where people are living longer and healthier. And, you know, there's life lessons in here. There's uh, Loma Linda, California is, I think we have more, I think we have a few now in the US. Um, but these are certain things that we could bring to our own communities. Now, what I like about this community connector, so far it's only in Colorado and I've been playing around with it, trying to see if I can create this myself for my state of North Carolina. But what's super cool, what's really cool about it is um, if you look at it, it's hard for me because I don't use Google Chrome, so it may not add, it may not show up the best way. But uh, the closer you are to one, the better. So you can kind of see, well, you know, economic stability, not so bad, but oof. Neighborhood and fiscal environment, not so good. You can look at the plots and you can see how well they're doing in certain areas and you can compare it to other counties. So this is, these are really important visualizations here that they have of health scores. And you can look at the demographics. You can look at what I like the most, the most similar counties. It'll pull this up and tell you which sort of counties are, are similar. And if you want to, maybe, maybe you're um, an economic developer and you want to do a little better, you can look at a goal county. Hey, this county always does better than us on test scores, blah, 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 they get more business. Let's figure out why you can kind of look at their secret sauce and their recipe and see, see what you might be able to do. So um, I don't remember what this is loading here. There's also a measure um, of this. This is great. I, I did this for my area, but you can go into the OECD regional well-being and put in your own area and or click on any of these other little right in here, find your place. And it tells you where you rank on housing, life satisfaction, access to services, civic engagement, education. You know, there's specific policies that can be brought in that can help. And what's very interesting here, you know, if you're talking around the social determinants of health, they be now become structural determinants of health when you realize that at the community level, some of these assets are just missing or underperforming. What I thought was funny is that my, my community has a similar well-being as Tasmania. And Tasmania is probably a lovely place, but I always think of the Tasmanian devil from uh, Bugs Bunny. And then, you know, we look at um, SNAP you know, the food stamps, and we look at eligibility by state, and who's losing, who's losing their SNAP benefits. It's the elderly. You know, we think that we're hitting one demographic politically, but it's actually the elderly that are feeling it. So these are just really important things that data can clarify for us if we are data literate. Like the Opportunity Atlas, you know, this is a good one because you can, you can look in here and I feel like it, this takes a long time to load, so we're probably not going to get in here. But you can go into these different counties and you can find out, you know, where are the most opportunities? You know, where are the most, what's the most likely place for children to rise out of poverty? And what do those measures look like? Let me see if it's loaded. So you can click. And, you know, you can get, you can ask questions here. You can find out. Um, characteristics, different characteristics of a community. You can say how, what's the household income? What's the incarceration rate? You know, and you can look at the different opportunities throughout these communities. And you need to dig a little deeper to do it, you know, to do it a, a, a service. But I mean, you know, take a look here. This, these are where the highest household incomes are. These are the lowest, you know? So, I mean, there's a lot that you can look at here. You know, where do American Indian children thrive? You know, uh, is upward mobility higher in cities or rural areas? These are learning opportunities as well. But these are all tools freely available that most people that I, I talk with aren't really familiar with. 
And then you can get your county health rankings too of where you live. You're like, what's your rank? You know, and here's the rank in North Carolina of these communities. And, and you know, what are they looking at? They're looking at length of life, quality of life, health factors, health behaviors, you know, uh, obesity, food environment, physical activity. These are all important fundamental things to consider when we're looking at, you know, healthcare outcomes. Um, much more so than just, you know, here, here's an income level. It's much more complicated than that. Look at the air pollution, severe housing problems, driving alone to work. There's a lot of information that in data that we can bring to the table to answer our well-formulated questions. And this one, this loaded up pretty quickly, it doesn't usually, but this is really important too, especially if you work in uh, medical, continuing medical education, you know, they're looking at physicians. How many physicians are there per 100,000 population? So these are really important. If you're, if you're in a, a desert, you know, with, with how many physicians are actually available, you know, maybe your, your scope of learning needs to be a little broader. And then, you know, this is just walkability. Number one, New York, of course, but, you know, walkability, that's one of the measures that makes you a blue zone. That you have walkable streets so people can get out and walk in their communities. Um, here is, what is all this? Oh, county level data by race, age, gender, you know, looking at diagnosed diabetes, you know, percentage, you know, in different, in different populations. You can look at different years. You can look and see about exposure. You can sit there and look at, you know, over time. These are all important outcomes and things we can measure across uh, different disease states. You know, um, specifically people that work a lot in, you know, uh, medical, medical education. They don't realize all this great live data that's out there. You don't necessarily have to go to uh, PubMed and regurgitate some random survey that a physician took in 2017. You can actually go and look at the source data and make your own calculations. The healthcare um, HCAP is really big. Uh, I mean, let me, let's go over to a quick stats table, see if that's faster. If you want to look at inpatient, perhaps, on a national level, um, you might be able to get more current years if you go to different types of information. So, you know, you just kind of scroll through here and you say, okay, I want statistics. Uh, you could say yes. So, you know, basically this will run data for you. Here, let me say no and see if that'll be faster. Create analysis. I just want you to see um, what what you can gather here. So basically, this is pretty much empty because I didn't pick enough things, but you can look at this type of information, number of discharges, percent of discharges. There's more current information available if you can go back in through HRQ. Uh, this is just, I put this in here just as an example to the kind of data that we have. A lot of times when I'm using these resources, I want to talk about the data that we have that is the most current. So that kind of drives what I want to talk about. And this is just a little, we're going to wrap up with a little information about Census 2020. And I want people to understand that, you know, there's something called differential privacy. And this is new this year because they're bringing, they're going to be bringing more data on board. So what they want to do is they want to find out, you know, how do we, protect the privacy of people and not impair the accuracy of the calculation, right? So they call it like an accumulative risk or a global privacy loss budget. How easy is it for someone to be re-identified? So what they do is they jitter some of the attributes. What jittering means simplistically is maybe with a measure that, you know, you would have one outcome, they make it off a little bit. They just kind of change the deviation a little bit so the number is not exactly the same. So it, re it diminishes the ability for you to be re-identified. So it's basically the noise they allow into the data they're collecting. And it's called an epsilon. Now, so if you have an epsilon of eight, you may have a very accurate data set, but it's so accurate that somebody could hack it and trace it back to you. And then if they did the one they recommend, say here's 0.25, it's very inaccurate, 
but no one, you know, your privacy is complete. What they use in the actual census, I believe, is an epsilon of six. So this is their differential privacy. And that's good. And, you know, these are the certain topics that they're bringing in for analysis. They're talking about poverty, inequality, fertility rate, you know, occupational structure, education, family, all things we really want to know about our communities because these drive funding, this drives resources to communities that need them. And so when they talk about accuracy versus privacy, you know, basically what they might do is if, you know, you're a 79-year-old male and they have all these... Um, attributes and your median number is a certain number, a uh, machine could go back and forth and back and forth and, and take all those different attributes and recreate them to find out what combination of people would give this number. So they start there and then they unpack it and go backwards. And that's how they could reconstruct a database and find out your identity. So that's why they're doing this accuracy privacy trade-off that's so important. And it's kind of fascinating to figure out how they do it. They, they're doing a certain part of this um, to figure out different things about the um, coronavirus using some of the data out of China, some of the latent variables that they can't possibly know, but they take the data they do collect and that they do know and they try to figure out what some of these latent variable values might be like around how uh, easy would it be to, how contagious is a asymptomatic person? You know, a lot of these things that we don't know, but if you have a latent variable and then you have some known variables, you can try to reconstruct the data and get some ideas and estimates around what some of those values would be. And it's extremely interesting. And, you know, I, I, like, I, I like this slide right here. Because basically what it's saying is, you know, you don't get people excited about, you know, analytics by like, hey, look, we can do differential equations, we can do algebra. You get them excited about, you know what we can do? We can actually say things about our communities with greater um, accuracy. And so that's, that's the objective, right? So let me see, I think we may be almost done oh yep questions like why is this guy's eyes open during <laughs> during his surgery um and you know we're going to do more of these there's going to be a lot more of these uh, especially with this remote way that we have um connect over on twitter and uh, we'll kind of be able to talk a little bit about the things that we do there. This is me, Data Mangrabani, I'm a member of the National Press Club, 500 Women Scientists, you know, and we're really all just trying to get together and, and figure out how to make all of this work. Um, I, I hope this was helpful to you. Please reach out and let me know other topics that you might want. Stay safe, stay healthy, and, you know, let's try and stay positive through all this. And I, I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. And look, I'm in Paris. <laughs> I figured if I could pick a background and a place to be, why not? Bye.